then I'm going to start recording. Okay, great. Well, thanks everyone for joining today. Uh, my name is Bora Akyol. Uh, my partner is Jeremy Hack. Uh, we both work at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, which is a U.S. Department of Energy uh, National Laboratory. Uh, my email uh, is Bora, Jeremy's is jeremy.hack, and we also have a project email called Voltron at pnnl.gov. So today we're going to talk about Voltron. Uh, this talk is specifically geared towards an interactive session. Uh, and basically feel free to unmute yourself and um, ask a question anywhere during the talk. I have about 12, 13 slides today. So we'll have plenty of time for discussion um, towards the end of the call as well. And uh, the talk is geared towards presenting an overview of Voltron, talking about one use case that we have been working on here at the PNNL campus, uh, and then talk a few slides about the cybersecurity properties of Voltron. And Jeremy, feel free to jump in anytime uh, you'd like. Will do. Okay, so what's Voltron? Um, Voltron is uh, Voltron with that one T is the name of a cartoon series that I used to watch when I was a kid. Uh, Voltron with two T's is uh, the platform that we have been developing really uh, since 2010. Uh, Voltron is an application platform, a lot like Android and iOS for distributed sensing and control applications. So at this point, you can ask yourself, like, what makes something a platform, right? Other than, wow, that's a you know, nice thing to call something. Um, Voltron has, by this time, like I said, we've been at this for seven years now, has a lot of utility and functions that are provided so that if you were doing a distributed sensing or control application, um, you can basically just write your own application and don't we'll have to worry about I need to know Modbus to talk to these devices, or I need to, um, I need to talk to EMP3, or let's see, maybe I'm going to go ahead and meet everybody right now, because I'm getting an echo on the line, but you're free to um, unmute yourself at any time. Yep. Okay. So I, I muted everybody, sorry about that guys, but you feel free to unmute yourself to ask a question. There was some echo on the line. Um, Voltron has, um, let's get rid of this, has the ability to talk to the cloud, Amazon IoT platform, Azure IoT platform, or basically pretty much any cloud platform that has some sort of an IoT service. Voltron has the ability to talk to uh, data stores, which are typically called historians in our domain, to push data out to. And it has mat mathematics functions. It has the ability to speak Modbus, uh, BACnet. Um, there's a group that is right now working on DMP3. There's an interface to talk to ChargePoint electric vehicle chargers through ChargePoint's web API. Um, and all of this code is basically available on GitHub, tested, proven, ready to use. And that's what makes something a platform. Um, it's the typical network effect. As more people use Voltron, uh, the more benefit we get from it and the more people contribute code to it. Uh, Voltron is not a protocol. Um, you know, somebody asked me once, hey, how can you compare Voltron to SCP 2.0? And realistically, you can't because SCP 2.0 is a protocol and there is a current work on being, uh, being done to add SCP 2.0 to Voltron. Um, it's just something that you do. Same thing with OpenADR. Uh, there's an OpenADR driver. There has been an OpenADR driver in Voltron for a long time. Um, Voltron also is not an application. Um, you know, they say, well, you know, is Voltron equal to demand response? Demand response can be implemented as an application on top of Voltron. In fact, uh, we have, and I'm going to talk about it in a little bit, we have done a lot more than that. Uh, but Voltron is not limited to demand response. Uh, you can do 
many things uh, on Voltron. Um, there are colleagues that work in the building uh, buildings domain that have written uh, uh, really a sizable set of automated diagnostics and fault detection functions to make sure that the building uh, HVAC systems are operating as efficiently as they can. And that's yet another application you can do uh, on Voltron. Voltron is open. All our code is on GitHub. All our meetings are open. Uh, our issues or bugs or features that we're working on, they are all on GitHub. And uh, we have an open technical meeting that happens uh, once a year. And we have biweekly office hours uh, as well. And these are office hours in the traditional sense of the word office hours. People just dial in and we're all, quite a few of the Voltron team members are on the line. And we basically just answer questions. Sometimes we do presentations on new features we're adding. Sometimes we were thinking about adding a new feature and we ask the community for feedback. Okay, so what are Voltron attributes? As I mentioned, Voltron is open, flexible, and modular. Voltron allows people that work in building space, energy space, to develop applications that interface with legacy and non-legacy equipment very easily. Uh, Voltron does not work only with Johnson Controls or Honeywell, completely interoperable across many vendors and many applications. Can Voltron talk to an inverter that supports Modbus? Absolutely. Can it talk to more than one type of inverter or more than one brand of inverter? Completely. Um, Voltron, one of the goals we had while developing this platform was to hide the complexity of dealing with buildings and power system and control systems from the developers of these applications, which we actually call agents. Um, from the developers. Like I said, you don't need to know Modbus, you don't need to know the MP3 or BACnet. All that uh, information is uh, presented to you in a well-defined data model and you can interact with it really easily. Voltron is, supports object-oriented modern software development. Uh, a lot of our team develops in Eclipse. You can debug it in Eclipse if you would like. Um, or you can go hardcore like me and use Emacs and the, the command line. That's also okay. Um, Voltron is language agnostic, uh, and I need to explain this just a little bit. Um, Voltron platform itself is written in Python, but you can run agents or applications written in any language. Um, we have a Java interface. We have, you could, people have run MATLAB code uh, talking to Voltron. You can do Perl, you can do CC++. You can interface it with various simulation problems. I see Energy Plus listed here. Uh, GridLab D, another PNNL project is obviously included in that as well. And basically our philosophy is bring what you have and we'll, we'll make it work. And that has proven to be successful because people have brought what they have and uh, it is working. Okay, so the next thing that I wanted to do in this talk is to cover uh, one project that we are working on at the PNNL campus. And this was a good demonstration of not only like one of the use cases of Voltron, but also I'll deal into how we have deployed the Voltron in this project. And as I mentioned before, uh, there's a button to unmute yourself. So if you have any questions about anything that I'm talking about, feel free to unmute yourself and ask the question. This is the Clean Energy Transactive Campus or CETC for short project. Um, the problem that we're trying to solve is to manage uh, demand and energy resources on our campus. And to do this, we are using transactive control technologies. Transactive control basically is a way of controlling uh, objects uh, in difference to using direct control methodologies where you're basically uh, pushing directly commands. You set a market. It could be a market for cooling. It could be a market for heating, et cetera. And uh, the, the, basically the nodes in that market decide amongst themselves completely distributed matter uh, what they want to do. 
Transactive control uh, is proven to reduce cost and improve efficiency. Uh, in this project, we're testing it in, at scale uh, in, a, in real buildings, uh, in multiple buildings at the PNNL campus with various heating and cooling systems. Uh, we, have, we are controlling lighting, for example. Uh, and uh, essentially, the goal is to get to a large campus deployment and in the power grid side, get to a deployment where we would be doing this on a feeder basis or on a substation basis, potentially doing transactive uh, control uh, with thousands, uh, maybe tens of thousands of devices. So the, if you go from that abstract vision of what the buildings are doing um, and how this is actually implemented, uh, this chart is something that we have done. Uh, those of you that it may be uh, familiar with how uh, you know, facilities networks operate uh, will recognize that there are some security measures that are in there. Um, but in, in a nutshell, we have one or more Voltron instances that are managing devices in all the buildings that are part of this transactive control demo. These devices exist solely on the um, facilities network at PNNL. The facilities network is completely isolated from rest of PNNL as well as completely isolated from the internet. And so to be able to do this securely, we use a protocol called VIP, which is Voltron Interconnect Protocol, which is based on, uh, it's basically a wrapper around zero and Q. We use elliptic curve crypto to encrypt uh, and authenticate the data. And this data is pushed through um, a firewall to a central uh, point called Voltron Management Central or Voltron Central for short, where then we basically write data to uh, a data historian. In this case, it is MongoDB, uh, but we have, uh, we have plans to switch to CrateDB uh, for performance reasons uh, later on. We also have users in this instance that have, um, that are external to the PNNL network. Uh, one is University of Washington. The other one is the, the Washington State University in Pullman. And they also have Voltron instances and they basically communicate through uh, a, a bastion host that we have on our external network that allows us to send data securely back to PNNL. And then finally, uh, we wanted to provide a web user interface to see data and analyze historical data, et cetera. So we have uh, a web interface for that and that, that basically is managed by this box in the middle that's called Traffic Scanner, which is a web, web application firewall uh, that we do. The, the way this works is each Voltron instance uh, controls and <coughs> monitors one or more devices. The Voltron instances um, exchange information with each other and they're able to manage, for example, cooling load on a building on a hot summer day, which those of you that may not know where PNNL is, we're in Richland, Washington in the Eastern side and it gets really hot here today, it's supposed to be in the mid nineties. And so we can manage the cooling load in that building um, such that the occupant comf comfort is maintained while we minimize the, the, the peaks and valleys that happen uh, if you looked at the power meter in, the, in, in that building by intelligently controlling the way the load is started and stopped. Okay, so this next slide um, talks about how uh, Voltron is architected. Um, the, the central uh, and really in the center of the figure here is the information exchange bus. Uh, Voltron uses a publish subscribe interface uh, for everything that allows us to uh, essentially be application language agnostic and uh, also establish a well-defined data model. Uh, because everything that goes into the message bus or the ex information exchange bus is um, basically is within that uh, data model. So you don't need to know specific APIs, et cetera, to basically 
um, do that. On the bottom side, you have what we call drivers um, and uh, external services. The drivers are what talk, uh, basically talk BACnet, Modbus, DMP3, or a RESTful Web Services API for some thermostats, or for charge point devices, we, uh, we talk to charge point web API. And all of this is built in. And so if you're talking to, say, a rooftop HVAC unit, you don't have to worry about what interface that is uh, being used, be it Modbus or BACnet, uh, or some proprietary interface, all that is represented to the applications that run on Voltron is basically the rooftop unit object. Um, and that allows people to basically code applications that are um, very general and able to interact with each other again because we have a well-defined data model. Um, in addition to uh, devices, uh, we have the actuator um, uh, agent, and that is allowed, uh, that basically is the only thing allowed to actuate devices. So if you have an application that wants to do a control action on a device, it has to go through the actuator agent. There's a good reason for that. One is security, but I, the second good reason is, is that if you have multiple applications trying to control the same device, Voltron essentially arbitrates between those so that you, you're not getting conflicted commands to that device. I mentioned the open ADR interface here. Um, the, the other thing that we do is the historian. Um, the way that the historian works in Voltron is, is that there's a base historian agent that is, uh, then, that is extended to talk to different historians like MySQL or uh, or MongoDB or SQLite, uh, either on or off platform. We have also interfaced with uh, Microsoft Azure IoT as well as Amazon IoT platform, so you can push directly to the cloud if you'd like. On the top side of Voltron, you basically have applications which are not shown in this figure directly, but you can basically develop any application that you'd like. You want to do demand response, you can do that. You want to do diagnostics, you can do that. You can do alerting uh, based on uh, you know, business rules. You can, you can also do that. Voltron supports alerts. Um, finally, we have a management cons console with a web, web user interface. This is the Voltron Central application that we discussed. And then we have the command line interface for debugging data collection platform management as well. Okay, so hardware options. Uh, we put the slide in there because we get the question as to uh, what does Voltron run on? Uh, Voltron pretty much runs on anything uh, from a Raspberry Pi to, uh, um, and really a lot of our users actually use Raspberry Pis, which is a dramatic uh, reduction in their cost to deploy uh, systems compared to a traditional uh, control system platform. Um, but you can also run it on Intel-based platforms. Uh, you can run it on basically anything that runs Linux. Uh, Voltron is built on Linux, uh, just in case you were wondering. When um, uh, we realistically, we haven't had a request to, to implement it on top of anything else at this point, because this is much more an embedded system space. Okay, the next part of the presentation is going to focus on uh, Voltron security. Um, we built this platform to go into the power grid as well as, as with buildings and other control system environments. Um, to be able to do that, we have to answer questions from day one as to, well, how, how is this gonna be secure when, when I deployed into my uh, control system or when I deployed into my campus? Uh, which may include, say, in a university campus like University of Washington uh, uh, Hospital, for example. So clearly, um, that's, that's an important question to answer. Voltron does a few things, uh, actually does many things, uh, which a few of them are on this slide. Um, first of all, the applications on Voltron, which are called agents, because Voltron actually supports an agent-based programming paradigm, um, those agents are protected 
the integrity of the agent code is protected through cryptographic means. Essentially, Voltron will not run an agent that is not uh, uh, protected and the, uh, the, the integrity of the code can be validated. We can also protect, and we do also protect agent configuration from manipulation. So you have a configuration associated with an agent. Uh, you can also cryptographically protect that. So you know nobody is going to mess with that configuration either maliciously or just because of a mistake. All communications between Voltron and external data sources and Voltron platforms themselves are um, done securely. Uh, let me dive a little bit uh, deeper into that. The communications between platform instances are uh, using zero MQs, um, elliptic curve crypto technology to secure the, the communications to verify both to or to verify the integrity and protect the confidentiality. And for external data sources, whenever we can, uh, and we haven't run into one that we can't yet, uh, we essentially use uh, TLS uh, secure socket layer or transport layer security to do that. On the inside of Voltron, in addition to protecting the agent code, uh, we secure the message bus, which is really the key communication mechanism inside Voltron, um, by implementing an authentication and authorization mechanism so that you get to decide who, if you're, a, if you're an agent and you're publishing some data uh, and you want um, potentially one other process to, or one other application to access that data, but not no others, you can do that by basically setting the appropriate access control rules. A more interesting case is when you are trying to protect devices from uh, uh, being controlled uh, by agents that potentially you don't want them to control it. And that is also implemented by that authorization process. And every agent in Voltron is authenticated. So you know exactly uh, what that agent is and where it came from. And finally, because this is a control system and one of the key requirements for a control system is uh, availability, we protect agents, uh, we protect the platform and other agents uh, by limiting the resources that a Voltron agent can consume. When I mean resources, this could be a processor, it could be memory, it could be storage, it could be network access, uh, but the key goal here is to ensure the platform stability. Um, I'm not going to go into this slide today, but I wanted to point out that security is never a process where you can do basically one and done. Uh, every Voltron deployment we have done, uh, both inside and outside, you have to go through this process, right? What are my assets? What could be the attack paths towards those assets? Okay, once you know that, you go, okay, how do I mitigate these attack paths or mitigate those vulnerabilities? So you have to do a security architecture. After you do that, you come up with risks that are mitigated and risks that are maybe lowered but not completely mitigated. So you need to understand that. And then finally, you need to test uh, what you have done to make sure that you, you know, your cybersecurity controls are working. And then finally, you go back over and over again. This is why this is implemented as a loop. As long as you have a system that is in the field or deployed in a building or controlling electric vehicle chargers on a campus, you have to keep doing this process because every day there, there could be a new vulnerability that comes up or something that we haven't thought of. So you need to make sure that those are um, accounted for and um, you have a security control, or at least you understand what the risks are. So what we have made available uh, with respect to Voltron security is we have a very comprehensive platform hardening guidelines for securing underlying Linux system. As I mentioned, Voltron is implemented on top of Linux which basically means that the, if you can have all the security you want in Voltron, but your underlying Linux platform is not secure, then fundamentally you really haven't done much. 
So we have comprehensive guidelines for platform hardening for the underlying system if you're building your embedded uh, Linux system yourself. Uh, we have a multi-platform message bus that, in, that, it, that supports encrypted communication that actually only implements uh, our recommendation, encrypted communication between Voltron instances. You can do authorization to make sure that only agents that are authorized are posting messages to the uh, message bus. And finally, you can also restrict who gets to listen in. On the platform, security and monitoring, uh, my recommendation is if you deploy any embedded system and you have access to it via console using SSH or via web GUI or via some other method, uh, it is good to uh, restrict uh, and reduce the attack surface to approved hosts. Um, if you're especially running protocols that, that are unlike UDP that require a three-way handshake, this is especially important because fundamentally you can tremendously limit the, um, the attack surface of the system. Uh, every Voltron instance that we have deployed uh, supports a system for forwarding critical log files to a third host. Uh, this could be Splunk, it could be uh, uh, another system that uses Elasticsearch, but it's good to get those logs off the platform. We have alerts that are done both in uh, Splunk or on the platform that can trigger emails to administrators if we suspect either a malfunction in the platform or potentially malicious activity. And then you can also monitor and alert uh, the messaging bus for interruptions. For example, you know, the, the average for that messaging bus is 200 messages a minute. Then suddenly for three minutes, you see no messages. That's reasonable to look at that. So we trigger uh, alerts on that and, uh, or unexpected val values. And then we also, we already talked about the role-based access to agent capabilities. And uh, the other thing we have done is agents execute in separate processes from the platform. So you don't have uh, potential memory space issues uh, or access to memory space issues. Okay, this is I think one of my last slides. Uh, and this is going to talk about Voltron support mechanisms. Uh, on the left-hand side here, you see our uh, Voltron GitHub site. Um, and you can see uh, some of the issues that are sitting here. We have uh, a Travis CI site as well. We do continuous integration and regression testing. Um, most, if not all of our code has unit tests so that we don't end up having regressions. Uh, we have a stock Stack Overflow um, topic uh, called Voltron. And um, our team members are very active in Stack Overflow as well. We have over office hours every other week at 11 a.m. Pacific time. And they are attended by the development team. Uh, and basically, we just answer questions. We, it's, it's open session format. And finally, we have an email address called Voltron at pnnl.gov. And every office hour section, session is recorded, and I will make this um, recording available there as well, so that you can, if you miss something, you can go back and listen in on that. And these are just a bunch of links that basically will get you where you want. If you want a copy of these slides, you can email me. Um, the preferred email address is voltron at pnnl.gov and I can send you the slides. And um, basically at this point, I think uh, um, this is a good time to stop talking and see if there are any questions. And if people are interested in hearing about some of the applications that have been developed in Voltron, um, you know, where, we're on the platform development side, but we, we could cover that a little bit and then put you in touch with people who could talk to you in more detail. Jeremy, you know a lot of those applications though. Do you want to briefly talk about some of the things that, uh, that people have done so far on Voltron? Uh, maybe some of the commercial customers also that are using, uh, or commercial users that are using Voltron? Sure, let me, uh, let me 
share my screen. Let's see, can you see that? Yes. Okay. Um, so this, I'm getting an echo. Uh, so there's several use cases that are being developed in, uh, in Voltron. Um, uh, you know, it can be used as a building automation system for small and medium buildings. Uh, secure data collection in support of third-party cloud analytics is one that we're seeing a, a lot of traction in, especially for uh, commercial companies, as Bora mentioned. Voltron can be deployed on very low-cost hardware, uh, so that makes it attractive uh, for companies who want to use it to securely collect data at a building and then push it up into their cloud where they have some uh, cloud analytics engines running. And uh, you know, they're not necessarily interested in the control capabilities of Voltron, but that secure data transfer is very uh, attractive to them. And with the license that Voltron has, they can take it and do whatever they want to with it. They could even um, develop some proprietary uh, code around it and not have to release that. But for the most part, people have been, uh, that have been using it are contributing back, which is, which is great to see. Um, Voltron could also be used for deploying energy efficiency and grid services at large commercial buildings. It allows utilities and others to have, um, have something to talk to at buildings, really. Uh, otherwise, it's just this load that's sitting there and maybe you can send signals to individual appliances or, or devices, but uh, Voltron provides a uh, place for smart applications to run and to provide a hierarchical uh, communication strategy where not everything has to talk to everything you talk to the Voltron agents uh, that are in charge of a building and then they can uh, take whatever high level signal you have and break it down into individual commands. Um, you also see use cases for uh, retuning mandates, uh, specifically in, in New York and Seattle, there's other examples uh, where Voltron uh, again provides you an, uh, an intelligent way to interact with buildings and allow you to get the, you know, to meet the goals of the retuning mandates in an inexpensive way. Um, some things that we're looking at right now are how to provide an interoperability platform for homes. Uh, so you, you know, every, every vendor has a, their own cloud instance basically for uh, IoT devices going to homes. Voltron could potentially provide an a, a integration platform for that uh, type of environment. Um, so we've kind of talked about that. You can see Voltron can be uh, deployed at the building level where it's communicating with individual devices. An alternative would be to have Voltron on a small device uh, right next to the thermostat uh, providing interface that way. So Jeremy, do you want to say uh, like uh, in a building, um, what, let's say you have a Raspberry Pi, right? What's the typical size of a building that you can control with that? How many thousand points, how many devices? Do, do we have any... Any thoughts on that? So on our campus, uh, we are collecting roughly, I think it's 6,000 points, uh, maybe more now that we've added some more buildings. Uh, our biggest building has a couple thousand points. We've got some that, that are all going through one Voltron message or one Voltron instance. We've got some external collaborators who are using Voltron to collect 8,000 points from a building. Uh, I think one of the commercial companies might have even had 10,000. And uh, that's basically a Raspberry Pi, right? Yep. Yeah, so that's a $35 device, essentially collecting 10,000 points. Um, so every five minutes or every minute, um, you know, that's a reasonable cost savings from what's available uh, on the commercial space. Yeah, and we've, we've uh, put in uh, a lot of options um, in the driver framework to make it so that if you are collecting a high number of points, how do you spread that out? Because... So there's, there's multiple, uh, multiple points of performance that you need to consider when you're doing a deployment. So there's what, what Voltron itself can do, but frequently what we run into is limitations of the infrastructure that Voltron's communicating to, uh, especially in cases where uh, you've got a token, token passing uh, protocol for a backnet. It's uh, very slow and we frequently run into cases where we're trying to collect data faster than, than that can, can handle. Um, so we've got uh, options in the driver to spread out that collection, to uh, group collections so that you're not hitting a single MSTP trunk at, at once, so you can kind of spread the load. 
Um, but that's, a, that's definitely a consideration. Uh, you know, you can collect data as fast as you want, but uh, the infrastructure might not be able to keep up and the devices might not be able to uh, respond as quickly as, as you're trying to collect uh, as well. Um, let's see. So there, here's an, an example of uh, energy efficiency and, and grid services for small, medium buildings. Um, you can e extract set points from uh, monitor data uh, so that you can enforce uh, the set point controls, uh, extract compressor on-off cycles without having to get a power measurement. Um, you provide intelligent load controls and transaction controls that allow you to um, uh, control those loads in a more intelligent way. So intelligent load control is uh, one of the main applications that is being developed on, on Voltron right now. And it'll basically allows you to intelligent, really, intelligently respond to signals from the utility without you know, sacrificing the comfort of one zone of your building. So you know, it's, you're, you've got this one big uh, art rooftop HVAC unit maybe, and so conserving that would help you meet your goal. But if you constantly do that, then the people there are gonna get uncomfortable. So how do you uh, work with uh, the other RTUs to kind of mitigate that um, uh, without you know, impacting uh, comfort? Because the uh, building managers are not going to allow you, allow you to run your, you know, super great uh, energy efficiency algorithm if people start complaining to them. Let's see. And so that's been deployed on the PNNL campus, and has been shown to uh, reduce peak electricity demand. So as you can see here, you know, this would be what the typical load would have been without ILC, and it was able to. Uh, keep under that uh, without affecting comfort. And that's, we've got it running on buildings on campus. We've never had anybody complain about that. Right, and I think that the typical like savings that I heard is at least on our utility bills is like 10 to 15% potentially because of the reduction in demand charges. Yeah. See, that's all I have on these slides. But like I said, um, if you are interested in hearing more about these applications, uh, we can uh, set you up. So some other things that have been developed are automatic fault detection diagnostic. So there's an agent that's running in Voltron and it basically opens up a damper in a rooftop HVAC unit, then watches how the system responds. And if it doesn't respond as expected, then it alerts the building manager that, you know, hey, this, this RTU is about to fail. Um, there's a demand response agent that when it gets a signal from uh, open ADR or some other utility signal, it, it uh, reduces the load on the, the devices that it's controlling. Um, and there's uh, several other applications that uh, we could go into at a different time. Are there any questions from the audience, any topics that they want to cover in more detail? Can I ask a question? This is Hong Wang. Sure. Uh, very much uh, Voltron is a platform, and uh, I just want to know the, uh, what is the computing power, say, uh, what is the computing power in terms of uh, uh, realize uh, a complicated uh, optimization and control algorithms? So that's not really a function of Voltron necessarily. It's, right. So Voltron is, is just a platform. It doesn't do anything on its own. Mm -hmm. um, it's the applications that are built on top of it. So it would depend on what that optimization application looks like. And, you know, so things like that, if, if you're, you've got a complex optimization application or some high-end analytics application, that's not something that's probably going to run on a Raspberry Pi. And so yeah. that, would, that would need to run on, so in that diagram that we showed, that would be on the main. Uh, sure, okay. On okay. The panel okay. So my understanding would be that Voltron is very much an interface services. Is that correct? It's a platform that enables applications to talk to buildings to and devices and, and uh, each other. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Well, so basically the main functionality of Voltron is a, a interface. It's a, to very much to bridge the uh, exchange of the data. Yeah. Well, I think you can look at it that way, but it's more than an interface, right? It's basically like if you have a smartphone and say it mm. runs iOS, mm. uh, iOS has a built-in functions in, in its own right. 
Yeah. And you add applications to enhance the functionality of that, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's the same idea here is, is that Voltron has built-in applications like weather service is one of them that can get, allow you to get weather forecasts. And whenever we come across something that a lot of people need, we usually just drop it in uh, as a service on the platform. Mm -hmm. but it, it allows you to basically build applications uh, okay. on that are aware of buildings and power grid and basically able to do, as in your case, it could be optimization. In somebody else's case, it could mm -hmm. be diagnostics. It okay. allows you to do many things. Right, okay. Okay. Uh, so if that is the case, I would assume that uh, uh, if we can integrate the, the, the computing power uh, with uh, Voltron, within the platform and uh, with the standard functionalities uh, like uh, uh, control function blocks, optimization function blocks, or toolbox, for example, that will certainly enhance the capability of Voltron. Is that correct? Yeah, and like Jeremy said, I mean, you don't have to run Voltron on Raspberry Pi. There's a similar form factor pl platform from Intel called uh, Nuke, or next unit of computing. Yeah, uh, it's basically you know size of like uh, I don't know maybe four matchboxes, uh, and it it can be powered up to a Intel i7 processor. Mm -hmm. So if you have something like that, you know quad core i7 processor, I think there's very little you can't run on that and actually like be done in seconds. Okay. Okay. Well, and along along the lines of that optimization question, that's something that Srinivas is. Uh, uh, working on right now. He's a, for those who aren't uh, PNL folks, he's a, a senior buildings researcher here at the lab. Uh, he, and he is working on an optimization and economic dispatch uh, uh, services in, in Voltron. So that, uh, that's something that could be coming that you might want to check out. Okay. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Good. So I wanted to cover one last thing before, uh, well, and if there are people with questions, of course, we'll stay on the line and take those questions. But uh, we always get the question as, as to how do I get Voltron? Uh, we have, so Voltron community is relatively large for at least a project started by a national laboratory that's open source. We have commercial vendors that use Voltron and they implement, like there's a company that is doing energy audits and energy efficiency services using Voltron devices to collect data from the field. And they are going to go up to 100 buildings, I think, in the Washington, DC area. Um, so Voltron is open source. All you have to do is point yourself at GitHub, and you can get it. We have a really good documentation page on Read the Docs, which is a website. I don't know if, Jeremy, you can quickly share that while I'm talking. And basically, you, we have a tutorial in there on how to get you started. Uh, and um, our goal. In, in having this call with the broader community is to increase the user, the amount of users that are using Voltron either for research, but also for commercial applications. And basically uh, answer any questions that you may have. Yep, that's our Read the Docs page. So in case you're wondering, uh, voltron.readthedocs.io, you can read it. There's, there's very good documentation on here. And if you have any questions uh, or need clarifications of the documentation or, or anything, just email us at Voltron at pnl.gov PNL and uh, we'll be happy to help you get started. Great. Are there any other questions that people want to get answers to today? Okay, well, I want to thank everyone for attending today. Uh, it has been a pleasure to present Voltron to you and uh, it feels, please feel free to reach out to us uh, if you have any questions or you, you want a private meeting where you know, we can talk about details specific to your use case. Thank you very much and have a good afternoon. Thanks everyone.